are still 12 teams that have not won a Super Bowl. And while some teams have not been around for too long, others have had a long, long history in the NFL, yet have not held the Lombardi. That isn't to say they haven't had great teams or even come heartbreakingly close, though. Which leads us until today's video. Join me, Hookshot Drew, today on video as we go down heartbreak lane and cover the best teams to have not won a Super Bowl. Cleveland could damn near be the capital with a forgotten Midwest. I'm sure Detroit could make a big claim to that too. The Browns had a strong legacy throughout the 40s, 50s, and 60s as elite contenders, winning seven championships with Otto Graham at quarterback and another with the legendary Jim Brown in the 60s. But as the Super Bowl era and the eventual merger with the AFL arrived, the Browns slowly fell into championship irrelevance throughout the 70s, but bounced back during the 80s, particularly with the hiring of one Marty Schottenheimer. I'm going to hone in on the 87 Browns team, although the pain was spread out well throughout this decade. The 87 Browns finished 10-5, winning the AFC division title after their offense finished third overall in scoring and their defense second. The Browns offense was a fairly balanced one with a two-headed monster running the ball, Kevin Mack and Ernest Biner, with Bernie Gozar slinging the pigskin at quarterback. Linebackers Mike Johnson and Clay Matthews Sr., the dad of Packers great Clay Matthews Jr., and all-pro corners Hanford Dion and Frank Minningfield headlined the elite Browns defense. The Browns made short work of the Indianapolis Colts in the divisional round, who despite being one of the worst teams in 86, turned their fortunes around greatly with the trade of Eric Dickerson from the Rams. The test came in the form of Mile High Stadium in Denver, Colorado. The Browns lost at home in Cleveland in the 86 AFC Championship, but it was time to play spoiler in front of hostile fans. The game started off sloppy, with Denver taking a 21-3 lead after the Browns turned the ball over three times in the first half. But the Browns came out firing out of halftime and made a strong comeback. Riding Ernest Biner's 187 yards from scrimmage and two touchdowns, the Browns drove into the red zone with less than two minutes remaining in the fourth, down seven. I'll let Biner tell this part in his own words. So I get ready to run over Lily, I pull the ball in. Get ready to lower my shoulder. Let it go so that this guy will fall off so I can run over Lily. Ball comes out. Fumble. The team made a lot of mistakes, and it seems a lot of Browns fans realize that heartbreaking loss doesn't fall solely on Biner's shoulders. The team turned the ball over several times against a very good team. It was Biner's determination and effort that led them back into the game. But it cannot be denied that this might be the best and most complete Cleveland Browns team in the Super Bowl era and certainly had the talent to win a Super Bowl. The little brother of the Browns. The Bengals themselves have had some great teams over the years, but perhaps none had a better chance than the recent 2021 Bengals team featuring Joe Burrow's breakout performance and insane playoff run. Sure, you'd be lying if you said they were favorites coming into the season, let alone the playoffs, but Burrow proved he had it when he masterfully guided the Bengals past the Raiders, Titans, and the Chiefs in close games. All of those wins, with the exception of Las Vegas, were on the road, cementing Joe Burr as an elite clutch time player. With elite weapons like rookie Jamar Chase, Tyler Boyd, and T. Higgins at the wideout spots, and running back Joe Mixon having a career year, Burrow was confident in slinging the football around. The Bengals defense wasn't known for being particularly stout throughout the season, but tightened up and played well during the playoffs, getting solid play from Trey Hendrickson, Jesse Bates, and linebackers Jermaine Pratt and Logan Wilson. Matching up against the mercenary-wielding LA Rams in Super Bowl 56, the Bengals fell into an early 10-point hole, but quickly came back due to the methodical play of Burrow and the Bengals offense. An issue throughout the season was the Bengals' inability to adequately protect Burrow, as he was the most sacked quarterback in the league during the regular season. And even then the win at Tennessee in the divisional round was tossed to the ground nine times. Against the tough Rams defense that featured a defensive line composed entirely of former first round picks, this theme didn't change much. Burrow was frequently pressured early and was forced into making timely big plays. Despite being sacked seven times and avoiding several more, Burrow and the Bengals offense managed to take the lead and hold it late into the fourth quarter. The Rams, led by former Lions star Matthew Stafford, engineered some clutch magic of their own, as Super Bowl MVP and Triple Crown winner wideout Cooper Cup was unguardable on the final drive. With less than two minutes left, the Rams scored a touchdown on a short pass to Cup and never looked back, winning the ring that eluded Donald and Stafford for so long and keeping Burrow's hand bare, at least for now. 
The Bengals had their hopes dashed twice in the 80s by Joe Montana and the Dynasty 49ers, with MVPs Ken Anderson and Boomer Esiason doing all they can to deliver a ring to Cincy. Burrow is still young and has plenty of time to make good for the city of Cincinnati. There's a few cautionary tales that Burrow and Bengal fans might want to be aware of when they're looking forward to the wide open championship window the team has. All time great quarterbacks like Dan Marino and Jim Kelly can tell you all about how fleeting the Lombardi Trophy can be, particularly when you're competing against dynasties. Speaking of Jim Kelly, let's talk about the Buffalo Bills now. Like Burrow, Kelly had a penchant for staying cool under pressure and delivering dimes late in ball games. Part of the famous 83 NFL draft loaded with Hall of Fame quarterbacks, Kelly didn't actually play for the Bills until the 86 season. As like with so many other top college stars of the mid 80s, Kelly was poached by the USFL and promptly lit up the fledgling league and set numerous records in his two seasons there. I recommend y'all look into the greatest game no one saw, featuring a young Steve Young versus Jim Kelly when Kelly smoothly brought his team back down 20 points in the fourth quarter. I digress. Kelly was a proven commodity when he joined the Bills, promptly starting a streak of five Pro Bowls in 87. But it is the 1990 Buffalo Bills we will focus on for this one. The first of four straight Super Bowl appearances for the upstate New York team, the Bills torched NFL defenses with their hurry-up, no-huddle offenses, leading the league in scoring in 1990 as well as a six-ranked defense led by the game's all-time sack leader, Bruce Smith who was enjoying his first Defensive Player of the Year season in a league leading 19 sacks. With talented weapons like running back Thurman Thomas, Andre Reid, and older but still game James Lofton, and tight end Keith McKellar, for which the K-Gun offense was named after, Kelly was able to use his brain to pick apart the Dolphins defense to the tune of 44 points, buried the Raiders 51-3 in the AFC Championship game to meet the Giants for an all-New York Super Bowl 25 in Tampa, Florida. Ironically enough, snowbirds do go south after all, you know. The 1990 Giants were no slouches themselves, led by legendary coach Bill Big Tuna Parcells. The Giants featured a loaded squad, particularly from their number one ranked defense, led by the greatest defensive player ever, Lawrence Taylor. The Giants got past the Bears and the back-to-back -back Super Bowl champion 49ers to set up the Super Bowl matchup. This game was very close throughout, with both teams' defenses making the offense earn every score. The Giants' Parcells had a plan for the no-huddle offense of the Bills. The Giants were going to play power football and control the clock. This strategy worked. The Giants held the ball for 40 minutes versus the Bills' 20. Buffalo, however, took a lead right as the fourth quarter began, going up 19-17. The Giants then drove the ball all the way to the Buffalo 3, where the Bills' defense held up and forced a field goal, with the Giants going up 20-19. The Bills had one more drive to win the game, starting at their own 10. Kelly and the Bills drove down the field, but short-circuited at the New York 29-yard line, setting up Scott Norwood, for a 47-yard field goal, and, well, chances are you know the rest, but here it is if you haven't. Buffalo fans, turn your heads. Scott Norwood, he can fire the shot heard round the world now. Here we go with eight seconds to play. High drama here in the Super Bowl. In the air, it's got the distance, it is. No good! No. Okay. Buffalo lost the Super Bowl by a single point. And although this would be the first of four straight Super Bowl trips, this would be the closest they'd ever get to winning a Super Bowl. The Twin Cities have had their share of heartbreaking losses, I would argue more than any other team. The Minnesota Vikings started their reign of sadness all the way back in 1969. Now, it wouldn't be heartbreaking if Viking fans had no reason to believe in their team, and like a lot of other strong teams, the Vikings have fielded. The 69 squad was nearly unstoppable throughout the season, finishing number one overall in both offense and defense for the season. With the offense led by one-year wonder quarterback Joe Cap, who finished runner-up in MVP to the Rams' Roman Gabriel. But the real strength was a loaded defense. With guys like Alan Page, Carl Eller, Jim Marshall, and the all-time interception leader Paul Krause, losing just two games, the season opener to former and future Viking great Fran Tarkenton and the New York Giants by one point. 
and the season finale to the Atlanta Falcons 10-3 in which the Vikings rested their starters in the second half to prepare for the playoffs. The Vikings beat the Rams and MVP Gabriel in a close game 23-20 in the divisional round of the playoffs, then beat the Browns in a convincing fashion 27-7 in the NFL Championship game. Whether you consider this a true NFL Championship game or not, this would be the Browns' last appearance in a conference championship game or otherwise until 1986. The league technically merged in 66, but it wouldn't be until after the 69 season that the two leagues would officially join schedules and start playing each other during the season on a rotating schedule basis. Some may consider this the final NFL championship game or just another NFC championship game. Either way, I doubt it dulls the pain of Viking fans based on what happened next. Super Bowl IV pit the Bud Grant coached Vikings against the Hank Stram coached Chiefs. The Chiefs themselves were no slouches. Yes, I used that phrase twice this video. Finishing second offense and first in defense in the AFL which was still considered the inferior league despite Joe Namath and the Jets beating the NFL Colts in the previous year's Super Bowl, which was the first Super Bowl called the Super Bowl. The first two Super Bowls were merely called the NFL-AFL Championship game. The Chiefs went 11-3 in this regular season, navigating a season in which starting quarterback Lynn Dawson was hurt and backup quarterback Mike Livingston went 6-0 as a starter and made the Pro Bowl. The Chiefs beat the Jets to start their playoff journey, picking off Joe Namath three times before moving on to face Oakland, who swept them during the season. Once again, the Chiefs defense stepped up and picked off four passes to win 17-7 and earned the date with Minnesota. The game was shaped up to be a slugfest with both teams possessing elite defenses and quarterbacks that could sling the rock. But it wasn't to be. The Chiefs defense swarmed Cap and the Vikings, this time picking off three passes and recovering two fumbles, going up big early. The Vikings managed just one score in the game, a Dave Osborne touchdown late in the third quarter as KC won their first Super Bowl 23-7 and solidifying the new NFL as a league with great parity filled to the brim with talented players and coaches throughout. If you watched our video on George Mikan, you may recall that Bud Grant was an NBA championship winning basketball player before becoming a head coach. Well, he unfortunately never added an NFL championship to his resume, but he was a Hall of Fame coach nonetheless, and even with zero rings to his name, Grant's impact on the game of football was felt for decades to come. Each of these teams suffered stinging defeats that lasted for years to come, but there are other teams we could have covered today. The truth is, only one team can win any given year. There's bound to be truly great teams that weren't able to get it done. Feel free to comment below which teams you felt we missed and great teams that have not won the Super Bowl yet came very close. I am Hookshot Drew and I thank you once again for supporting our channel. We have seen a lot of growth lately and it's all thanks to your support. If you like this video, please be sure to like, comment any, any suggestions or anything that comes to your mind and subscribe for more. And be sure to share with your friends. Once again, Superb Sports Media and stay tuned for more.